Uh, thank you for coming and joining us for this discussion on uh, gun violence and our school security practices. Uh, I'm Erica Meltzer. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Colorado. We're a, a nonprofit news organization focused on education coverage. Here in Colorado, we live, of course, always in the shadow of Columbine. We have a generation of children that have grown up with lockdowns and lockouts as a regular part of their school experience. Across the country, school shootings continue to punctuate the news cycle with alarming frequency. Uh, earlier this spring, we had the entire metro area held hostage to fear as uh, law enforcement searched for a woman who had expressed a fascination with the murders. Uh, as, uh, and of course, it turned out that she had already taken her own life uh, while we were all sitting at home waiting to find out what was going to happen. And then a few short weeks later, violence tore through STEM school in Highlands Ranch. Uh, taking one life and irrevocably changing countless others. And of course, um, you know, youth suicide and individual acts of gun violence continue to take far too many lives in our state. So how is this affecting the children growing up in this atmosphere of fear and uncertainty? Uh, what do they need from us as adults? And what can policymakers and legislators do that would make a real difference. We have a number of students here with us tonight and to share their experiences and perspectives. And first and foremost, we want this, this space to be about hearing from them. We are also joined by um, House Majority Leader Alec Garnett, who represents House District 2 here in Denver. Um, uh, we, we also have um, State Senator Robert uh, Rodriguez, who represents SD32, State Rep. Uh, State Rep. Emily Sirota, who represents HD9, and Alex Valdez, who represents HD5. Um, from the Denver School Board, we have Jennifer Bacon and Carrie Olson here with us tonight. Thank you. Um, uh, board Member Olson has a prior commitment later this evening, so if you see her um, duck out early, that's why, but we really appreciate her making time for the first half of our um, program. And um, we'll also be hearing from um, Eileen McCarran from Colorado Ceasefire. This is an advocacy organization that works to reduce gun violence through education and political action. And we also have Mike Eaton, the chief of DPS uh, Department of Security. We thank him for being here tonight as well. Um, in the audience, I want to um, recognize um, State Senator uh, Julie, Go um, Julie Gonzalez. Um, Uh, State Rep uh, Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez and uh, State Rep Kyle Maloka. Is he? And I think I also see Paul Cashman here, so thank you. Um, and I just want to say a few quick words about our format tonight. Um, as I said earlier, we want the focus to be on the students. Um, we may very, very well have some disagreements in the room about what the best path forward is, and we, of course, want to be respectful of different viewpoints that we hear. Um, we also know that we'll have a lot of questions, and we have a lot of time for questions built into the program. Um, Hazel, um, Hazel and Amy, can you wave your arms for people who don't know you? Um, they're going to be passing out three by five cards for people to write down questions. They'll be collecting them and organizing them by theme. And we're going to do our best to get to all of the questions. Um, we're also going to find a way to sort of make that visually obvious, sort of what the themes are. If there's something you think needs attention that isn't getting enough attention, um, find one of them and, and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. Um, so before we go further, um, I'd just like to take a, a moment of silence um, for the victims of the STEM shooting and uh, for, for victims of gun violence everywhere in our state. Thank you. Um, and I would like to invite Eileen McCarran to sort of set the table for us with um, 
some information about what policy tells us. Thank you. Uh, technology bedeviled me, and so I had great slides to show this with, but instead I'm going to have to go with this because we couldn't get it to work, so um, connections weren't correct. Anyways, I'm going to talk about gun violence and gun policies, particularly with regard to youth and school shootings. Um, you know, massacres are not something new to our state. Uh, back in 1864, there was an awful massacre at Sand Creek, uh, where anywhere from 50 to uh, 500, they don't know how many Native Americans were killed by Colorado militia. Then in 1914, the Ludlow massacre of people striking um, in the coal, in coal fields, uh, the Colorado Guard was sent out by the governor and they used machine guns and machine gun and, and also other killings that happened there, 21 people died. But in terms of modern mass shootings, in 1993 there was the Chuck E. Cheese in Aurora where four people were killed and then Youth with a Mission and the New uh, Life Church in 2007 where four people were killed and then the Aurora Theater in 2012, which is probably in most of our memories of people living here, where 12 people were shot and killed and another 70 wounded. Then in 2015, within about a month's time in Colorado Springs, they had a street shooting where three people were killed, and then the shooter also, and then only less than a month, or about a month later at the Planned Parenthood uh, in Colorado Springs, three people were killed. But I broke out the school shootings because that's something that's very much um, primary on people's minds tonight. Um, in 1999, as was mentioned earlier, the Columbine happened, that's about 20 years ago, where 12 students and one educator were shot and killed. In 2006 at Platte Canyon High School up in, I guess it's Bailey, I think, um, Emily Keyes was shot and killed in a hostage situation. Then 2010 at Deer Creek Middle School, no one was killed thankfully, but two students were shot. And um, they actually, the shooter was tackled by a math teacher. In 2014, Arapahoe High School, Claire Davis was shot and killed and by a fellow student. And in 2019, just happened less than about a month ago, uh, the STEM school in Highlands Ranch where Kendrick Castillo was shot and killed when he and some other students were tackling the shooter. <clears throat> in response to a number of these situations that I outlined, Colorado has passed a number of gun violence prevention laws. In 2000, the voters, not the legislators, but the voters enacted the um, closing the gun show loophole. And it was actually passed by 70% to 30% statewide. In 2013, about six months after the Aurora Theater shooting, we enacted five new gun laws, and the most important of those were a universal background check and a high capacity magazine ban. I had a great graphic of gun violence statistics, but I will just share that in 2017, we had 778 gun deaths, of which 591, or 75% of them, were suicides. 75% of gun deaths in the state are suicides. What's interesting about the graph is I also graph on it the number of guns sold, picked as doing background checks. And the suicide curve almost parallels the, the gun purchase um, curve. But considering youth from ages 0 to 18 in the last five years, we have had five unintentional deaths, 70 homicides, and 130 youth suicides. So what about all those guns contributing to it? Well, in the United States, there are about 380 million guns is, is one estimate. No one's quite sure exactly. That's more than one gun for every man, woman, and child in this country. And another thing I think we should keep in mind 
is that in this state, since the concealed carry was passed in 2003, we now have 252,000 people in this state who have concealed carry permits. That means many of those people are carrying guns around in our society, and when they go home, what are they doing with them? When they're going places, where are they setting them? Are they carefully locking them up is a question. So after the uh, Parkland shooting, NPR asked experts, well, how can we stop school shootings? And they actually, this is a long, like three or four page list of the experts. Uh, first, they had a three-prong approach. First is universal for everyone, and it's promoting safety and well-being in the schools and addressing school climate. And on laws, they gave assault weapon ban, high capacity magazine ban, check, we have that, and universal background checks, check. We have that. Then they had for protective factors for students who were having some difficulties. They talked about getting adequate counseling help. That's increasing our mental health uh, services to students in school and also reforming of our discipline practices. And the third were interventions when violence is present or imminent. And they talked about having threat assessment teams and then for laws they said extreme risk protection order, check. We just passed that, the governor signed it April 12th and Representative Garnett, Majority Leader Garnett was one of the prime sponsors, so thank you. So I'm gonna talk about some policies that could be these, I'm talking about state laws policies because that's what the realm we work in. Um, that might address youth. And I would say there are other policies I'm not gonna mention that have a, could have a huge impact on gun violence in general, like such as licensing or violent, uh, pro prohibiting guns to violent misdemeanors. But instead, I'll do the ones dealing with youth. And the first one is passing a child access pre protection law, uh, prevention. Excuse me, we do not have this in the state. Many, many states have these laws where adults would be subject to penalties if they allowed unsupervised access of firearms to, to children. So what does this have to do with school shootings? Well, the Wall Street Journal reported that in most of the cases, it's like 17 out of 20 of the cases where they could identify um, where they got the gun, the young people got it at home. And that was what happened in Highlands Ranch, as we understand, but we also have heard from news reports that they actually broke into the safe. Um, benefits, the statistics, I will say, vary dramatically on what people believe the benefits are, going from zero to 50%. Uh, I did see that the states that have it as a felony, which is Florida, see a more dramatic decrease in child shootings, and particularly unintentional. So how, what effect this has on youth suicides? It turns out 75% of gun, uh, youth who commit suicide get the guns from the homes of their family or friends. Uh, also reduces stolen guns, when stolen guns can feed the market that young people can go get because they can't legally buy guns if they're under 18 or 21, depending on the gun they're buying. And so reduced homicides uh, perpetrated by youth. The second one is moving up the age for long gun purchases to 21. Actually, it, long guns currently under federal law, you have to be 18 to buy one. Long gun, I mean rifle or shotgun. Um, handguns, the age is 21. Actually, Colorado doesn't have a law saying that. It's federal law, and because of our universal background check in 2013, then the, the, uh, the FFLs, those are federally licensed firearms dealers, have to, um, have to, uh, have to, they have to go through the background check. I've been given time, and so waiting periods is another issue, um, allowing a cooling off period for people who buying guns, and they can show a 2017 study showed 17% drop in homicides and up to 5% drop in suicides. And polling says 74% of American um, people without guns in the home support it. Uh, reporting lost and stolen guns and increasing uh, security at these gun dealers because the um, youth will be getting 
uh, guns through an illegal market. I did want to talk about arming teachers because that's one of the things that people say, we want to arm the teachers, and it's too bad I had all these cartoons on it. Just a whole scad of reasons why it is bad idea to arm teachers. There has been a bill for the last six years, every year, to arm anyone going into a school with a concealed carry permit. And if you want to see me, I'll give you lots of reasons why this is a bad idea. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for setting, being a good role model on the time, and I'm sure we can revisit that issue uh, during the questions. Um, we'd like to hear from, um, from our students, um, from our students now, and I think the first person we have speaking is uh, Gabby, who is a rising senior in DPS. Um, please excuse me, I may stutter or pause. I haven't really spoken in front of a crowd in a long time and I'm, I'm a little nervous, maybe a little more nervous. Um, my name is Gabrielle Rhodes. I am 17 and I go to Denver South High School. <laughs> um, as many of you may or may not know, Denver South High School went on lockout on May 8th which happened to be the day after the STEM shooting. Um, <laughs> placing you into my shoes, that day would have been one of the worst days I've experienced at school. I have never had to be afraid of going to school until that day. On the day of that lockout, I received a text from my mother asking me if I was okay. In that position, we both were unclear of the situation given at hand, and I texted her that I loved her, wondering, if to, wondering to myself if, that, if that's the last time that I would be saying those words to her. Going to school afraid that something bad is going to happen shouldn't be a worry to students. We should be worrying about failing a test or you know, the seniors that stand before us. But unfortunately, we will live in a world where school shootings is a routine. One person who is able to get a gun as easily as I am able to say hello is a concern, and that should be a big concern for now. Um, sorry. <laughs> one person that travels from one state to another, shutting down over hundreds of schools, should be taken into account. What does this say about us? What does this say about the laws that are made for guns? As adults and parents and people who can make a change, Please, I am begging you, please make that change. It's my, I shouldn't have to worry about my sister going to school or if I'm going to see her next, then tomorrow. You know, these weapons are made to protect us, but how much are they really protecting us? So please, please, please help us. Please let us live till we're older. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Elise, who is a rising seventh grader. And um, Elise's mom learned recently that um, she had, during the last uh, all school shutdown, that she had written her last will on her cell phone in the event that she was killed in a school shooting. And she's going to read that for us tonight. So this is my will. If I die, my best friend, Abby gets all my clothes and $200. Avery <laughs> gets all my investments and $200. Eli gets my Michael Scott, that's what she said poster, and $200. Blake gets $200 and my best wishes that she gets to be a professional soccer player when she grows up. Cameron gets my record player records and $100. Chloe gets $100. Rowan gets all my furniture. And Zoe, one of my good friends, gets $100. Thank you. Yeah. 
And next we have Charlie, who is a recent graduate. Hi, oh, hi, my name is Charlie Jones. I graduated from DPS in 2018, and I'm here to shed some light on a topic we don't often talk about. Um, we bring up gun violence, and it's gun violence in black and brown communities and how that carries over into school. Um, so, as a senior in high school, I was more worried about going home, um, how I'd get there, than I was worried about being shot in my school. And when we heard about Parkland in 2018, we, uh, all my friends and I, we, um, we weren't phased. We were like, oh, okay, like, this happens in schools like this, but um, we were like, we, we made jokes. Not jokes, uh, that's what happened. It was, this is something that we've become numb to because gun violence affect, uh, affected us on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we were the, the product, the consequences of these gun violences happening in schools. When a school like Columbine was shot up, it was a school like Manual that got the metal detectors and the more security guards. And that is a direct correlation to the school to prison pipeline. And I would like to, I guess what I would ask people who could change that is we don't need more officers in black and brown schools. For <laughs> oh, we don't need more officers in black and brown schools for a when it's, when it's not black and brown schools that are being shot up. It's suburban schools. And we have these kids who have to deal with authority on a day-to-day -day basis, and they don't need to come to school to deal with more officers. Officers to a black and brown student doesn't mean uh, protect and serve. It's more of detain and derail. That's, that's the, the truth, in my opinion. And so we need more mental health services in our schools. We need more. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of nervous, my voice is shaky. Uh, but we need more mental health services in our schools. We need something to prevent kids lashing out. And when something like Parkland or Columbine happens, the consequences of those and the security that is put in place does not need to be put into a black and brown school. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up those points. Uh, next, we have Maggie, who's going to be a junior next year. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I'm Maggie Pitoro. Um, I'm going to be a junior at George Washington next year. Um, yeah. So. Ahead of this event, I had dinner with a couple of family friends last weekend, and two things came up that I thought were pretty substantial. Um, the first of which being, we mentioned that the first thing we do every time we enter a new classroom was look for a potential place to hide. And the second being that, to kind of paint the picture of what happens in a lockdown, was that what ends up happening is we all kind of huddle in a corner somewhere and start furiously Googling our school, our neighborhood, to try and find out what's going on. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is that communication, because I think it's a really big issue that we have no idea what's going on in a situation like a lockdown. Um, and I think it's important to note that the kids themselves aren't the only people affected by lockdown slash lockouts. Their parents are, their community members are, because no one really knows what's going on. And colleges have things like the Cleary Act that allow them to communicate with their students, whereas high schoolers have nothing. Um, and in talking to some or er, school board members and school representatives about this, I've kind of discovered that it's illegal to do that because we are minors to have something like the Cleary Act, but that doesn't make it illegal for our parents to get alerts, for our teachers to get alerts, because then they can then communicate that to us, and I think that will diminish a lot of the fear for everyone. Um, and then the second thing I just want to mention is gun control, which I originally didn't want to talk about because it is so controversial and so many people do disagree. But I'm a very fact-based person, so I just wrote down a couple of facts in light of that. So in February of last year, the Washington Post did a study on the states with the most forms of gun control. So coming out on top are Connecticut and California um, with seven types of gun control. And comparatively, Colorado has four. So Colorado, or sorry, 
Colorado has a gun-related death rate of 13.4, Connecticut has a gun-related death rate of 5.1, and California has one of 7.9. So statistically, more gun control does reduce the gun-related death rate, and honestly, I think that that's the best solution for the kids who are in the schools who are facing these impacts, but also for the people like Charlie are talking about who are more scared to walk home from school and live in their own neighborhoods because of guns, and I just think that's the best solution as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Amelia, who's going to be a senior next year. Hello, my name is Amelia Federico. I am the daughter of a first responder. I am a student. I am the product ripple effect and advocate for generations of hurt. I would say the time is now, but the time was now the first time. I'm here tonight to, set, to shed light on a part of gun prevention that can sometimes go unnoticed. Background checks, banning military style weapons, and so much more is only addressing half of the issue as I see it. I have been a DPS student my whole life. I know how dire the other half is to not only student success, but ensuring all student needs are met. That other half is mental health supports. If we think about any incident with school violence, the individual causing harm was not mentally stable. If I think back to when my mom told me about Columbine, I was baffled, which then led me to the question of how did that happen? What drives someone to cause such violence is the preventative part of gun violence that needs as much attention as background checks and banning military style weapons. I have seen how a full staff of mental health supports creates a healthy community. I have also seen how the lack of mental health staffing has the potential to perpetuate violence. Mental health can no longer be extra. It can no longer be we don't have the funding. It can no longer be twisted mindsets. Mental health professionals are the root of student success and the root of student safety. Mental health has not, <laughs> mental health has to not only be seen as dire, but it has to be advocated as if it is as dire as the way that we say it is. We have to start advocating from the roots up, not the branches out, and acknowledging that the problem doesn't only begin at the gun shop. What truly drives someone to such violence is beyond my area of expertise. But what I do know is that it takes more than a rough day at school. It takes more than a low grade or a fight with your parents, a kid picking on you. It takes years and years of built up hurt and neglect. We as students need and deserve someone who is going to be there for us when those moments happen and to not allow it to go unnoticed and to grow into something beyond control. Students cannot continue to walk into school every day on edge with the current climate of violence that surrounds our schools, on top of everything else students are stressed out about. Gun prevention is something that has been a part of my life since birth, and I didn't even know it. My mom was a first responder for Columbine, and I've seen how heavily it's impacted her life. It sometimes, get, it sometimes gets too difficult to even talk about. When I was asked to speak here tonight, I thought to myself, I shouldn't stretch myself too thin, it's finals week. And as I was writing this speech, I was supposed to be studying for my history final. But then I thought to myself, ensuring that students are safe for generations to come needs to stop being put on hold. I also thought to myself, the feeling that I felt when I was in math tutoring with my teacher the day of the STEM shooting, and how my principal sent out an email that there was an active shooting. That feeling I will never forget, and, in, and the shooting wasn't even at my school. The fear surrounding school violence, experience it directly or indirectly, nobody deserves it. 
not as a politician, not as a community member, and not as a neighbor, but as a student. This is the voice we need to be hearing from the most. So why am I even hesitating? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few minutes uh, for Mike Eaton, uh, DPS Chief of uh, Department of Safety to speak. And um, there were sort of two important issues that were touched on here. And we've asked him to uh, speak about the protocols around lockdowns and lockouts and the protocols around what is and isn't communicated. Um, but I think the issues that Charlie raised are really important and I hope we circle back to them during the questions. Great, thank you. Um, again, my name is Mike Eaton. I oversee all of the security and police operations for DPS across all of our schools. And, you know, when I was asked to talk about lockdowns and lockouts in our processes, you know, I could very easily stand up here as a school administrator and, 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 and speak to that. But I want to speak to you as a parent because I am a parent. I'm a parent of five kids. And two of my boys were at Arapahoe High School when that shooting happened in 2013. And that changed my perspective of how we deal with, you know, uh, violence in our schools, as well as how we communicate to our stakeholders and our parents. Um, being down there and trying to communicate at the time, one of my boys was locked in a closet for two and a half hours at Arapahoe. My other son, who was a freshman at the time, ran out. And I was no longer a security chief. I was no longer a first responder. I was a freaked out parent. And so, Talking about our processes and thinking about that from a parent point of view has really been a priority for me and one that I have communicated with my team. And that's why we've been very uh, diligent in looking at how do we secure our schools and how do we lock down our schools and how do we lock out our schools in the most effective, efficient, and fast way. Second, save lives. And how we create that layered approach is exactly how we should be doing that. But one of the areas that we still need to improve on, and one of the areas that I know our communications department is seeing, is how we communicate to parents. In the age of social media, in the age of texting, in the age of you know, the news media you know, putting out there quickly, it is really hard for us to get that information out to you as parents accurately and timely when we are also dealing with our priority of mitigating the threat. When my team shows up with the Denver Police Department, we want to take action quickly and we want to mitigate that threat as fast as we can. And as we start to get information, we try to communicate that out to our parents as quickly as we can, but unfortunately we haven't done a great job. And our communications team isn't here tonight, they weren't able to be here, but I do know that we are looking at making significant investments in a system that other districts use that we would get ready to deploy here in the fall to where we can quickly give you that information. Our goal is to get is a single overriding communication objective. How do we get information out quickly and accurately in the first five minutes of a critical incident? And we need to look at those systems to do that because as a parent, I know I wanted information and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get information except texting with my son. We tell kids don't text in the classroom. It's the first thing they're gonna do in a lockdown. And we have to accept that. So how do we make sure that one, we are looking at this from a multifaceted approach of mitigating the threat, dealing with what's coming out on text and social media, and getting you accurate information on a situation that is very fluid, ongoing, and changing. And so that's what we're doing. And we're learning as we go. We learn from our partners nationally. We learn from our partners locally. My team was down at the STEM uh, school when the shooting happened and assisted with their reunification plan. And we learned from that as well. And so please rest assured that we are looking at our communication practices. We know that that is, the, that is one of the biggest challenges we have in one, meeting parent expectations, but two, also in prioritizing mitigating the threat and getting accurate information out. I also want to share with you all that we have made significant investments in our lockdown processes. We've made significant investments in our training. Melissa Craven, who's our Director of Emergency Management, who's sitting over there, raise your hand, Melissa, she'd be happy to meet with you individually or talk with you afterwards. 
Robert Grisson, who's my deputy chief uh, next door, would be happy to talk with you about any questions you have in regards to our automated lockdown processes and how we train our schools and how we've invested in technology to do that quickly, safely, and immediate. And how we have the ability here in DPS to have a quick response from Denver police as well as my armed patrol staff to mitigate and support schools that may be in crisis. And so while I have only 30 seconds left and I can't go into that, um, we build upon those investments as we go. And we learn as we go. And we learn to not only mitigate, but also prevent. And I think that's what you all are um, here to talk about as well as um, prioritize. So thank you for this time to speak with you. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna transition to um, to our panelists here, and we're gonna ask um, each of these folks to speak for um, for about four minutes. And if there's something you want to that you heard that you want to respond to, or if there's a policy commitment that you're prepared to make tonight, uh, we would love to hear that. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Greg from Interneighborhood Cooperation to come up. He's gonna be taking some notes, and a, that was a acknowledgement that I neglected to make at the beginning. Thank you to Interneighborhood Cooperation for. Uh, for hosting us, and we also have one more elected official in the audience, Val Flores from the State Board of Education is here. And um, we're actually running just a little bit ahead of schedule, so, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, um, so so, so while I wasn't gonna give Mike two bites at the apple, but um, I think it would be great to hear um, with all the focus on school security, how we prevent that from having um, a disproportionate impact on our students of color when the mic comes back your way. Um, Is working? It should, yeah, and I, and I think we have one uh, right there. Uh, okay. Do you want to Hi everyone, I'm Emily Sirota. I am the state representative from House District 9, which is Southeast Denver. And I am also a mother of two, and an aunt, and a community member. I struggle to talk to my own son about the lockdowns, lockouts, active shooter drills, um, and not even the drills active shooter scenarios and to put into words to him uh, what is going on in our world, in our communities, in our state of Colorado. And it's difficult and I empathize with all of you as, um, as parents, as educators who have to go to school every day in the wake of these shootings and acts of gun violence. Um, our society is ill, and we have got to take steps to address this epidemic. And I don't purport to have all of the answers. What I pledge to do is to work with you as community members to continue the dialogue over the summer, over the fall, so that we are ready to take steps in the next legislative session uh, to address gun violence in Colorado. I will be serving on the School Safety Interim Committee, and um, the chair, Representative Michaels and Janae, and I have already been busy talking about our agenda, issues to address, experts to hear from, and I hope that you will continue to be in touch with me so that we make sure that we are reaching um, reaching out to everyone, that we are considering everyone's opinions and uh, so that we can take the proper steps uh, to, to hit the ground running uh, when we start our next session because um, the status quo is clearly unacceptable. So uh, thank you and I'm happy to answer questions later or to talk offline with any of you. If folks want to get involved in the School Safety Interim Committee, what, what do they need to know to follow that work? On line. Uh, there is a website. Uh, there, it, it's part of the, the state website, so I think all of the documents yeah. uh, will be posted there and the meeting times will be posted there once they are set. Ledge.colorado.gov. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Alec Garnett. I'm the House Majority Leader. I represent House District 2, which is the youngest um, House District based on the average age of voter in the state. I like to say that it's the hippest House <laughs> District in the state. It has great neighborhoods like Uptown, Cap Hill, West Wash Park, Baker. I'm usually saying that to crowds from like all over the state of Colorado, so I'm sure many people on this panel think that they also have the hippest uh, district in the state. Um, I've served in the House uh, for five years, and I have worked on gun violence prevention issues uh, each one of the legislative sessions that I have been there. I am a parent as well. I have a three-year-old, and I have a 10-month-old. My three-year-old's early childhood center was on lockdown last week, and I actually had to have the conversation that I had been having with parents, that they had been having with their kids, with my own three-year-old, which, as you can all imagine, um, was a very, very difficult conversation to have. And what it made me realize is that this he is going to be a part of, and so is my daughter, unless we see drastic change, they're going to be part of this active shooter generation. And to the students who spoke tonight, thank you for your courage to share your stories with us. Thank you for talking about your personal experiences. It matters. That's how you create change. I know it's a busy week and there's lots of things going on, but the time that you took tonight means a lot. Um, to Ceasefire, to Mom's Demand, uh, to Hazel Gibson, um, to our electeds from uh, DPS and the State Senate and the State House, to our members who are here in the crowd who aren't even on the panel, um, thank you for taking the time because we all deeply, deeply care and we want to create change. There is a big gap in who is sitting up here tonight. There is nobody who represents our federal delegation in Washington. And if we truly want to stem gun violence, there has to be a national solution. The state, as you heard Eileen McCarran talk about tonight, who I have worked with um, for my entire time at the legislature. Eileen, thank you for your service. Um, she was so instrumental, and so were so many of the moms here, and Ann McGeehan, former state representative, in the passage of the Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill, which, can I just say, took on more manufactured opposition from the gun lobby than I have ever seen any piece of legislation take on in my experience at the Capitol. There is a organization, the Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, which is despised by the NRA because they are more radical than the NRA, that operates here in the state that is trying to recall Tom Sullivan, who is, whose son was lost, um, who was murdered um, at the Aurora Theater shooting, who said he was gonna, who campaigned on gun violence prevention, who worked with me and my colleagues to pass the Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill, and now is being recalled because of it. All of that is to say, we stand firm on continuing to move forward on policies that can prevent future gun violence, whether or not that's uh, raising the age, whether or not that's safe storage. These are things that we will be considering. But the one thing that the legislature did that isn't getting enough attention this year is the, uh, the amount of resource and policy change that we put into mental health services for our kids. We have the high, one of the highest suicide rates for teens in the country. We need to continue to invest in mental health. The uh, school safety interim committee that uh, Representative Sirota is going to take the lead on this summer is going to continue to help uh, uh, increase access to mental health services and capital construction needs that our schools may need. There are endless solutions and we are committed to doing it and thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you all. My name is Robert Rodriguez. I'm the state senator for Senate District 32, which is south, southwest Denver. Uh, this area is part of it. I go all the way from Harvey Park, Sheridan, to basically Colorado Boulevard. So um, I have the hippest district on this area because I have all of their districts in mind. So I win that one. Um, no, thank you all. I uh, come from a criminal justice and mental health background. I work with uh, people coming out of prison and trying to do mental health and one of the big things, and to what Alex said, yes, we did a lot of steps for mental health resources and is it enough? 
Probably not, and those are discussions that we'll be working on more, but we did offer a lot of resources to work on this. Uh, Alex's work on the extreme risk protection order was two years, you know. This year, I ran to support it. I had support from ceasefire. It was something we all spoke about, and every time you do take one step, something happens, and it takes a little while for these things to start happening. My research I did on the extreme risk protection orders that were going across the country. You know, I think Colorado's committed from the universal background checks, the magazine limits that we've done, and the fight we do with the Rocky Mountain gun owners as somebody who saw the legislation from 2013 and the recalls that happened then. This stuff always happens and we have to keep fighting and fighting. But the changes we made this year were a, a great step. Um, but are they enough? No. I'm honored to be invited here to listen to your stories. Solutions, just a little research I have, you know, how much is enough? Do we want to make schools fortresses? I wholeheartedly agree we need more mental health counselors, more treatment and therapy and addressing people for their trauma and the, dick and the problems that caused this to happen. Um, it's something I'm committed to work on and anything that you guys have, I wrote down notes from all the students that spoke. I always think talk to the front people because they're the ones that know other than people that just go to a seminar and read a book and say this is solutions. Hearing stories from you is what's going to make the most change. And please, be, please come to the Capitol and help us. I look forward to any legislation and committed to work on anything we can do. In my next few years, this was my first year in the legislature, so I, I learned a lot, but I'm very proud of Alex and the work he's done, and I look forward to supporting and helping promote any changes we can make. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Valdez. I represent House District 5, which is downtown Denver, Rhino, uh, Lower Highlands, Jefferson Park, a bunch of great areas uh, right here in the middle of Denver, so I would say I have the best district. It's pretty easy. Um, you know, hearing, hearing a seventh grader read their will is, is, is very jarring. And, you know, I don't have children, but uh, I remember the first time I ever heard the words lockdown, and it was about three weeks before I graduated from high school on um, April 20th, 1999. And I was locked in a room, and the time for school to get out came and went, and four o'clock came and went, and I started to get worried that I was going to be late to work. And I worked at Century 16, uh, where I had my first job. And so hearing all these stories and, and just thinking about it, it's, it's, it's always close to all of us. And it's horrific. It, and it's only getting worse. And, and my worry is, is that as we, as we go into the future, it's not just about what's happening in schools today. It's about the post-traumatic stress that it's going to be inflicted upon an entire generation of American kids. And I think, uh, you know, my hat is off to Majority Leader Garnett for the work that he did on uh, the extreme risk protection order, but we all saw what he had to deal with. And now we see that our colleagues that voted in favor of it, one whose son was killed in, in the theater shooting, uh, they're under attack. They're, they're trying to recall them. So this is going to have to be an all community effort to say that enough is enough and that our schools should be a place where kids go to feel safe and that we have to turn the tide on what we're doing. And so, so you know, I'm going to end by, I, I came here, I was watching MSNBC, and they were talking about um, the crime bill of 1994 and how a lot of different presidential candidates who voted for that bill are taking a lot of, of heat for this. And I, and I thought, but that was the bill that gave us the assault weapons ban that made me able to go to school without knowing what a lockdown was. And so we need federal action. We need big federal action. And we need to listen to all of our communities, especially uh, communities like mine that are communities of color where we understand that police presence doesn't necessarily feel like safety. And we need to continue doing good work on mental health. So I'm committed to that. I would like to see Colorado pass an assault weapons ban. I would like to see us all make it uh, a reality. But it's going to take everybody. It's going to take hundreds of thousands, millions of Coloradans to get behind us and say, this is what we have to do to prevent what's happening now and to ensure we don't have a generation of people who are forever traumatized from just going to school. Okay. Even though I'm a, is this on? Yep. Even though I'm a teacher, I'm going out of order because I'm, I need to be at George Washington High School tonight. So. But I'd like to say thank you to everybody who organized this tonight. Um, Amy and Hazel, you worked tirelessly to make sure this happened. 
And what I'm most looking forward to is this not being a one and done. It's a continuous meeting. I understand we're going to have more and we're going to continue because I do believe that the answers aren't going to be quick or easy. But I will promise you that I will walk with you and I will help you figure this out. And I will use the position that I'm in right now as a board member to help figure that out from where I sit. I was a Denver Public Schools teacher for 32 and a half years before I assumed this position. So I taught before we needed to worry about things like lockouts. We only worried about those weird ditto machines where you went like this and the purple ink went everywhere. Those of you in the room who are old enough to remember that, you remember that. And then the first couple times that we, when I was teaching, I can remember having to start locking our doors to our classrooms, which was strange. And then came lockouts and I was teaching during Columbine. And the progression of violence in our society has now made it where children just say they know what an active shooter drill is. My own daughter for, called me from college when there had been something on the dark web that they were going to come and shoot all the women at her school the next day. And she said, should I use what I learned about active shooter drills? And it was a little surreal to me to think that my 18-year-old daughter, away all the other on the other side of the country, was talking about an active shooter drill. But that's the reality that we live in. But I think that all of us together, everyone up here tonight, has a way to find the answer. I think that we can work through this. I also know the importance of mental health. I've sat with some of the students in here tonight, um, Amelia especially, I don't know if she's still here. Yep, there she's in the back, and Molly. We've been meeting since, I think, January, once a month to talk about how to increase mental health supports in Denver Public Schools. We've been thinking about that, and as a classroom teacher, I saw how important that is. And recently, I had the opportunity to go to DSISD. One of the teachers called me and said, you have to come today at 11.30, and you have to hear what my students have to say. And I was so shocked by what kids were saying because the conversation was different from what I even remembered a year and a half ago as a teacher. Students were sharing their notes on their phone, as you heard the seventh graders say, and they said, oh, did you think about to add this in your last will and testament too? It was like this common thing that went through the room and I was shocked. Kids also shared with me how they didn't feel safe anywhere anymore. One boy said, I don't feel safe going to the movie theater, I don't feel safe going to the grocery store, and I don't feel safe at school. And then they started sharing tips about where to hide and I it just really struck me and one girl looked at me and she said my dad says I'm blowing this all out of proportion please tell people kids are not blowing this out of proportion and I promised her that I would say that tonight that kids our children are asking us for help tonight and it's up to us to respond to them and listen to them and take them seriously. And it's a hard conversation to have. As you shared, you had to think about this with your three-year-old. I can't imagine those of you who have really young children, but it's up to us as adults. Children look to us to protect them. So I pledge my support tonight is to help you figure this out. I don't have all the answers either, but I'm happy to help work with you through this. And I'm so sorry that I have to run now, but I'm on my way to GW. And thank you again for having me here tonight. Thank you. Can I say one other thing? Sure. I just want to say one other thing. One of the first things that when we get to on the board for Denver Public Schools, we meet with all the staff. And one of my first meetings was with Mike Eaton. And I had absolutely no idea all the thought that went into keeping our students safe. And the fact that they can lock down a school, as he said, within seconds of something is amazing. And what he doesn't tell you is he and his team look around the, all of the United States to see what are they doing in big cities like Miami, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago. What's the latest? So I have a newfound respect for security and I just wanted to give you a shout out because I know you think about this 24 seven. So thank you again. Thank you. Dr. Olson, I'm sorry that I'm grimacing. I'm looking right into that light. Um, but also, the stories that we've heard tonight, I think it's important that we all actually humanize this because at the end of the day, we are people in positions of power to be able to change our communities and our outcomes. And so I grew up um, in South Florida. If I lived maybe four or five more blocks north of where my home was, I would have gone to Stoneman Douglas. Um, I was in high school, I was a senior uh, in 1999, but because I didn't go to Douglas, I actually went to school down the street that was primarily African American, and so I understand what you feel like because my school had two sheriffs present, 
in it. Um, I went to school with metal detectors and wands. Um, and for me to be able to see the difference between, at the time, a school like Douglas, which was primarily white, um, and a school like mine, I went to Boyd Anderson, and to see the difference um, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, was really heartbreaking, and, and that's where I knew there was such a thing as injustice. And so when I hear students tonight, one, it's really important that we elevate student voice and that they are really at the table when we make policy decisions like this. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, this conversation about uh, the first time you hear active shooter, right, to where we are now, it reminds me of some of the things that we used to talk about as a dean. Um, as a high school administrator, I actually got a phone call. I had two students at the Aurora uh, movie theater that night. Um, one was injured. And it's like the most terrifying thing to experience um, is not only anxiety, but the actualization of that fear. Um, but in talking to students, um, you know, students ask us the questions as adults, like how does this behavior become exacerbated? And it just reminds me, because kids are the first one to tell you how it feels to be in school. They're like, and my students used to be like, if I get out of line, you check me, right? And so it's like, what have we done to allow the boundaries to get farther and farther away from what it is that we are feeling, right? How can we figure out how to put, reinstate those boundaries to adjust Right? and to really shape what it is that we expect in this world and as this community. And so when it comes to commitments, um, I will say, you know, the Board of Education, we take this really seriously. We talk um, a lot about this, and I will say, you know, big shout out to Esfer um, for talking to us. And one of the commitments we'll make is to really have this conversation about mental health support, but um, go beyond that. So just, just as something for us to think about at the district, is um, for us to get there, we have to fundamentally shift how we're operating. Um, we have to stretch a dollar to, to Montana and back, uh, courtesy of our school funding issues here. But that's something that we need to sit down and do. It's not just saying it, it's opening the books and really pushing us to figure out, does our budget match our priorities? Um, and this is something that we have to say it doesn't um, and really get to the bottom of it. Um, we've heard from our communities. I represent Northeast Denver, where Manuel's located. Five points to the airport. It's the largest district in DPS. Um, and these are the, the neighborhoods um, that actually experience a lot more of not just the lockdowns, but the lockouts um, for a different type of crime that we're not talking about here. So, you know, Chief Eaton's going to address your issue. But after, um, after Parkland, I was knocking on doors in my communities, and parents and kids said two things. They said, I don't want to be arrested, can we have more metal detectors? And the reason why my community said that is because my community is the one that's presumed to be criminal more often than not. However, they also want to be safe. And so that is the tension we have to figure out, and my um, answer to that is figuring out those root causes like mental health support. Because no one wants to feel criminalized, which is why I posit there is a disparity in treatment in schools, but they also want to be safe. And so that is something that I commit to, getting to those root causes, restructuring the way that we're operating so that we can provide the mental health supports and also get to the bottom of our communications issues and figure out the teams we need to build to get better. Thank you. So I think you wanted me to address, you know, some of the concerns regarding police in schools, security in schools, the disproportionality that brings potentially to, you know, students entering the criminal justice system. And everybody's heard about the school to prison pipeline. And how do we reduce that? And, you know, one is that I've had a lot of conversations across the district with different student groups, um, both, you know, students um, uh, in different um, socioeconomic status, students of color, students with different backgrounds. And, you know, we've heard this. We've heard, you know, we need to take cops out of school so that we're not criminalizing our black and brown kids and we're not criminalizing our students of color. And that, and so when I bring up specifics around, like, you know, well, what about, don't you have a great relationship with SRO Jones? Or what about Officer Blea? Oh, well, I'm not talking about them. I mean, those guys, the, the, you know, those guys are great. Well, those are the officers that are serving your community. What about the Department of Safety, Campus Safety officers that you've connected with? Well, no, we're not talking about them. We're talking about the people that come in from the outside. 
And so I think really, you know, it's not about, it's, it's definitely recognizing and naming that we do have a problem with disproportionality in DPS. We do have a problem with, you know, why are we seeing more students of color, you know, being ticketed or put into the criminal justice system? But the answer isn't just pulling cops out of schools. That's not the answer in my opinion. In fact, I can name several different times that we have worked with Denver Police and our team in connecting with students. Out of Denver Public Schools operational areas, so we talk about food services, transportation, safety. The Department of Safety, which is 135 members, has the most diversity out of all operational areas. Because it's important to me that the schools we're serving make up people from those communities. And that students connect with folks with different backgrounds and different uh, ethnicities. And so it's not about taking cops out, it's how do we build those relationships and how do we connect with those kids? It's a paradigm shift. When I first got here eight years ago, people would ask me like, can you park your car around the corner? Or you know, we don't want a police car in front of our school. How about we you know, do a paradigm shift and say, police and security are a positive part of our school community, but also it's on us to continue to work on doing a better job of how we connect with those kids. And so we wanna continue doing that. We wanna to continue to connect with kids. We wanna be a positive, um, a part of their academic experience in our schools. But at the same time, we do want to name and recognize that how do we work on not criminalizing students for punitive issues, and how do we work together to ensure that that, that that achievement gap and the disproportionality of students going into the criminal justice system reduces or is eliminated. And so, but again, it's not a radical change of taking cops and security out of schools. It's cops and security, mental health professionals, because we need more of that, and I know our superintendent is committed to investing in more mental health services, and getting those to work together. Because we all need to support our kids, and we all need to be a positive influence in their experience in, in, in DPS. Okay. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, um. Uh, before we move to questions, I don't mean to interrupt your, your lap situation, but it, if, you wanted, um, if you wanted to say anything, I'd like wanted to extend that opportunity. Okay. Or, uh, or I, um, okay. go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to say too much because I think it's really important that we get to the students and, and hear a lot of the questions. My name is Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez. I represent House District 4 um, in Northwest Denver. So North High School is in um, the district. I'm actually also a DPS alum myself. Uh, and I graduated from North High School. So anybody from North High School? <laughs> um, you know, I, as you can see, I have my son here. I have three kids that also attend Denver Public Schools. And much like Representative Sirota, I think, you know, that's, that's really where our heart is. And, um, I, and to your point, sir, um, with regards to the officers in the schools, you know, going to North, we always had an officer on duty. And um, I think that that also would require them being also properly trained, right, to, to work with juveniles. Uh, in my work now, I do work in juvenile justice and child welfare and have been doing that work for the last 16 years and have worked very closely with Denver Public Schools, with Department of Safety, with the courts, with probation um, around the school to prison pipeline issues and the need for those mental health services in our schools. So I would definitely be in support of those kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the things I think that hit home when we did hear, I was on the committee that heard the ERPO bill, and a young woman talked about being from the generation of active shooter drills. My children are in that generation. I was a senior in high school when Columbine happened. And it was all too real and too close to home. Um, my cousin attended Columbine and was actually in the room next door um, when that all went down. And my, I've had incidents at my children's school where they have been on lockdown and they're in elementary school. And it's extremely frightening and distraught for a parent to hear that information or to show up at the school and see cop cars racing to the school, which did happen. And it's probably the worst thing um, to have to go through. So I appreciate um, allowing us to be in this space tonight and to hear from all of you. Uh, so thank you.
Thank you. And I also wanted to give um, uh, Senator Gonzalez an opportunity. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to thank everybody in community who is showing up um, to participate in this conversation, to the students who are showing up and sharing your experiences and your policy ideas. Thank you so much because that is what we need. My role in this, I, um, Julie Gonzalez, I represent Northwest and Downtown Denver as your state senator in Senate District 34. And my role in this is to co-govern alongside community, right? And so it's not me, I have all the solutions, look at all these amazing things I have. It is how am I gonna listen to you all and then fight for those things at the, at the Capitol, right? And um, I think it's fascinating, uh, the folks who are here, um, the conversations that we are having, because this is a rational, thoughtful, nuanced policy discussion, which is, kind of the opposite of what happens at the Capitol. Because quite frankly, um, what happens at the Capitol then becomes a hyper-partisan, um, absolutely, you're, if you want to have any measure of gun safety legislation, you must be um, just a radical extremist and how dare you, and, and that is so, um, different than this conversation and this uh, this uh, process that we are engaging in right here, right? And I think that that's actually a big part of that is because we are having face-to-face -face human interactions as opposed to Facebook flame wars, um, which, and I just want to lift up the, 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 the role that disinformation and um, this sort of um, hyper fear-mongering is also playing in this debate. Right? And so to hear and to center the voices of young people um, who are living this right at, at the forefront of this conversation is so critically important and thank you all for being here um, as, as, as we as policymakers listen to this discussion because you all will offer the solutions that we then carry at the Capitol. So thank you all for, for, for being a part of this. Thank you. And as we transition to the audience questions, I wanted to give uh, the students who spoke earlier, if they have any, do they have any follow-up questions? Is there something that they heard from this panel that they, that they want to respond to? Okay. Okay, so I think this can be answered in kind of a different way from all of you. But I think over these past couple of weeks in this country, we've seen political figures go to some extreme political lengths on social issues, but I don't think that's happening with this issue. So I guess my question is, are you willing to go to lengths for this issue? Yeah. Right. And um, before you go, do you mean on the gun control issue? Yeah. Okay. Specifically on gun control, what, are you, what legislation are you willing to bring? I can start, and I don't know that I need to, there's probably not a thing you in the audience could name when it comes to gun safety legislation that I wouldn't support. I'm from Southeast Denver, and as I knocked on doors running for election, um, that was one of the first things that came to mind to all the people whose doors I knocked on. It was in the wake of the Parkland shooting, and, um, and they wanted to know what was I going to do? Was I going to support, um, you know, more background checks, uh, more restrictions to access to guns? I mean, yes, I, I support it all, but um, you know, we have an entire state to um, to address, and I am not representative of the entire. I mean. I, my job is to, to serve the people of Colorado, but my views are not necessarily the same as um, you might find in Southeast Colorado or Northwest Colorado. And so we have to, or, or even a little closer to home. And uh, so, so we have to, we have to work um, with folks who have a different makeup. And so what I can say is that I pledge to push the envelope as far as I can and to, um, to use my platform to talk about this issue uh, in a rational, fact-based um, manner, uh, in a way that uh, stands up for our kids, for our educators, for our communities. Um, but we also will need all of you there bringing your voices too, uh, because 
Um, as Majority Leader Garnett said, the opposition and sometimes really the manufactured opposition um, is really strong and really forceful and we are seeing it now in the recall against Representative Sullivan and potentially more recalls to come. So um, yes, I am there with you and I, I will stand up and use my platform and my voice uh, as strongly as I can, but we have to work across the state. No, just as you address that, um, as a leadership position, you're balancing the legislative agenda with all the other legislative priorities and the opposition that you know you're going to face. And so, um, so keep, please address that in your answer. Sure. Um, great question. I think when I think of gun violence prevention in particular, you have to think through different, different jurisdictions, right? You have, you have local, you have state, and you have federal. And it's really important for each jurisdiction to pass the types of solutions that fit best into the level in which you're operating. So an extremist protection order is a judicial order that's set up to help prevent somebody who's a significant risk from, to themselves or others from getting access to a firearm. A municipality can't pass that. A federal gov the federal government can't pass that. That is one of the most effective state policies that you can put in place to help prevent suicide and help prevent uh, mass shootings. When you look at the other solutions that Eileen uh, mapped out, whether or not that's age, um, safe storage, um, uh, and there was one other one that sort of escapes me. These are other policies that sort of factor into what states can do and what uh, Connecticut and California have done to help prevent future gun violence. But when I said that there was a gap that's up here in terms of the next level that can really, instead of create a patchwork, create a full blanket of protection across the United States, it's the federal government. And the fact that we need the federal government to take significant action um, is a very, very important uh, piece that I want to make sure when we leave here tonight that we are applying the same pressure that we're hearing tonight, which is very important, on that next level because you have to do it there. And we can't lose a recall. Okay, so all the moms that are out here are walking day in and day out for Tom Sullivan. If we lose another recall, which we did in 2013, right, we lost two and then we essentially lost a third, it created four, it created five, created six years of a legislative gap. We cannot lose a recall. We must stand up to the gun lobby. We have to show the strength of this community. And when you see that strength, you will then see us continuing to move forward to fight back and put in uh, policies that work. And, um, and so are, are we going to see a safe storage law, for example, a child access prevention law? You know, we just came out of the legislative okay. session. And so these conversations have already been taking place um, with with almost every member that is here has brought up uh, bringing forward legislation like this in the 2020 session. They're working with Ann McGeehan and Moms Demand and Eileen and with all of us and that those conversations will continue but conversations like this help guide those conversations and so it's hard for me to say for sure but um, it seems uh, like there's a good chance. Um, and I think most of you will find everybody on this table in this room, Denver, we all support the gun changes in the legislation and to what Emily said, it is a bigger discussion when you get to Capitol because the, you know, and Alex said with the recalls, it, the ones we even had in, uh, in 2013 is like, you know, that was Pueblo and some of those people don't support that down there. And I, even Parkland, when I walked, it was interesting conversations because, you know, the issues that come up in the news are the things you hear on the doors. And when Parkland happens, depending on part of town I was walking, I had people in Southwest Denver that, you know, it's a mental health issue. And then when you get into the discussion, they would more discuss it. But I think everybody in this room would support any legislation that we could do for gun control. It's just having the conversations and realizing that it's a hundred person uh, legislature and it takes a majority to do it. Uh, having the trifecta that we had this year, we were able to pass a lot of these bills and not having that and it changes. You know, the hope is, is we can get as much if never happens, the pendulum swings over and the the, the Senate's held by two seats and that could change. And then 
all both chambers are blocking each other's yeah. bills. The bills Alex ran for years were, were dying on the gun control. That's why it took years for it to happen. And the work just has to be happening, the conversations. But I don't think anybody in this community we have in Denver would support anything not good gun safety controls that I've seen in any of the races. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate uh, again what they said. Uh, I come from House District 5, and, and they would support any sort of, of gun legislation. My constituents want to see it. Um, that isn't the question. The question is, uh, how do we raise the army like the one that uh, Majority Leader Garnett was speaking about that is out to get people who want to make progress on these issues? And when I've knocked doors before, countless times, I've talked to somebody who had, you know, the, the flag with the... the live free or die i can't remember that you know what i'm talking about and they got the truck and the american flag and they are a gun owner and they too have children and they too are saying the same things that's common sense how many times i heard you know so it, it's finding a way to to move these issues and to frame these issues in such a way that they appeal to everybody because when polling is done on uh things like extreme risk protection orders it's very popular across the board but when it actually comes to the capital like senator gonzalez said it falls apart so we need to have that army of people behind us uh people like you who care enough to come out tonight uh and we need to listen to the students okay. so so um i had i was just gonna give okay. you two if, ideas that i heard okay if they're new um, go ahead yeah, yeah so uh the communication piece i think that's something that that we could talk about um you know trying to look at ways to make communication better during these sorts of incidents and then uh again echoing that we need federal government pressure Pressure okay. to restore the assault weapons ban because ultimately that is going to make us all safer so yeah okay. um, and then I think Amelia had a okay well well they're not passing gun legislation but so I think not yet not yet <laughs> Just wanted to Hi again, so my question is, do you commit to building a student advisory council to support, to support the drafting and implementation of statewide and school district gun control and mental health policy? And then. And then if I could get just like a yes or no and maybe like a sentence of like an explanation. Yeah, uh, yeah let's, let's hear from the, the district. Okay. Um, yes, I, we have been asked of this a few times at Denver Public Schools. We have three great groups of student leaders that we need to bring to the table on this. Um, I propose we do it as a joint resolution with students at DPS. Okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, if you, if you have something. Yes. Like, yes, okay. Uh, the door is always <laughs> okay. open. And I, I mean, what I can tell you is that so many students from have come to see us this year. This is an issue I want to hear from students on. My door is always open. My phone is always on. Okay. Yes, I uh, would support that wholeheartedly as somebody who had some some high school students on my uh, my committee with my bills. It's, it was great dialogue, and I'd I appreciated all the input that I got. So. Yes, I would even uh, encourage that we're all part of the Denver delegation and we could, we could host um, a group and work with DPS to get a group of students, which has actually happened in the past. It hasn't been consistent enough, but we can work to get uh, some student advisors to come and we can come to you, but we could all kind of do it together. And my card's up here and it has my cell phone and my personal email and we can follow up that way. Yes, um, I too commit, and, and I like or Majority Leader Garnett's um, idea, and also just want to share that we are already ha planning to have uh, student voices heard um, presenting to the interim committee, and so I think that that will be useful, but also uh, a more sustained and consistent uh, format for students to speak and have a voice, and some sense of authority I think would also be of use. Can I say one thing? Sure. Uh, just real quick, at the legislature, uh, members who are up here have defeated, I just want you guys to know some of the good work in terms of the bad bills we have defeated in the past in almost every single year. Representative Sirota is on the State Affairs uh, Committee, but we've defeated uh, guns in schools, stand your ground, laws that apply to businesses, allowing uh, concealed carry permits to skip background checks for gun transfers, repealing of all of the work that we did in 2013 um, to arm uh, felons and 
uh, permitless concealed carry, which has come every year for the last nine years. So these are bills that come up every single year. So if you don't have certain people, if my title wasn't majority leader, if it was minority leader, then these wouldn't be bills that were defeated. These would be bills that were passed. Hi, again. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, in direct response to the school board member and uh, chief of safety, we talked about um, not taking out school, uh, school officers and security guards, and I'm, I'm all for that. I don't want, I like to feel safe as well. I, I enjoy my safety. But uh, we also talked about a plan to um, decriminalize and the disproportionalities going on in those schools. And I would like to know what the direct actual plan is because all we've heard before is we have these plans, we have these plans, we have these plans, but we've never seen the real action. We still have those, those um, the wands and the metal detectors and everything going on in our schools, but I would like to know what, we, what will we do to build that community between police officers and kids of color? Thank you. And um, so we are now back on schedule, which means as we answer, um, try and be a little brief so we can get to more questions. Thank you. No, great. Thank you for that question. I think it's, you know, one is it's looking at our discipline policy and making sure that our discipline policy matches what we are um, prioritizing in the district. And I think it's also continuing to build that relationship with Denver police who are responsible for, you know, dealing with the criminal issues. And I think that one is that um, under this new leadership, uh, 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 Chief Pazin and his team uh, is very, you know, um, uh, versed and understands, you know, reducing the school to prison pipeline absolutely needs to occur specifically for our students of color. And two is that um, when police officers trust the discipline process and they trust and know that there's accountability, um, and that they're part also of that process of how do we work with, with students, they're more apt to look at what can we defer to discipline versus just let's just write a ticket and be done with it. And I think that we gotta have more conversations around that and we also need to do more work around that. Um, so I used to organize with Padres Unidos and I wanna give them a big shout out for the work they've done to end the school to prison pipeline. One of the things that um, I did as a board member a couple months ago was pass a black excellence resolution. One of the challenges that I think we've had at the district is we talk about equ equity and inclusivity a lot, but I wonder if we're checking as much, right? As well as are we creating the Im infrastructure to do that and address the very difficult conversations we need to have about race. Um, and so uh, the black excellence resolution required that all staff and DPS from bus drivers to teachers do implicit bias training and that we actually pull the data on African American students um, to see where they're actually at and that schools will create an equity plan to figure out how to not only address potential disproportionality but also what is your plan to promote black excellence to get students to the finish line get into honors classes or gifted versus figuring out how uh, suspension is a tool in the toolbox. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our question from our audience, this is, we had a lot of questions. Um, this would be for Chief Eaton um, about communication during lockdowns and lockouts. And uh, the question is, if you want to mitigate a threat immediately, why do you not tell teachers um, directly what's going on? Why did teachers at South High School have to wait until the end of, of the first day of the lockout to find out what was going on? Why are teachers not engaged as allies? Yeah, that's come up a lot about how do we communicate with teachers, how do we communicate with folks in the classroom when we have to take action. And I think one is that um, that's something we have to look at. And I think in, in the new systems that we're looking at for the fall, that will address some of those concerns. I think two is that it goes back to accuracy of information, right? A lot of times at the onset of an emergency, we are investigating, we are looking into what's going on. And the last thing we want to do is create panic when we don't have accurate information. At the same time, we gotta balance that with how do we also get critical information to our stakeholders who are in the school. And so we're continuing to look at that, and I think that's where we look at national best practices around what has worked in other large urban districts. Um, and then we also had a question, parents want more open dialogue about what safety policies in place, how are teachers trained, um, 
what is the story that kids get during a lockout versus what gets communicated out uh, to the parents is certainly one that I've encountered where kids say a lot of things and you don't know which things are rumors and which things are true. Um, and, and I'll add on my own question, as you go through this process, what are you going to be doing to get feedback from parents as you revise these communication policies to make sure they're responsive? So one of the things we started last year, and really kudos to you know Commander Melissa Craven for doing this with her team, is we held parent information sessions. And we held several parent information sessions, specifically in the fall semester, and we went through what are your students trained on in regards to emergency management? And how do we respond and how do we train our teachers and our school administrators and so on? And unfortunately, you know, we had some sessions that were 100 parents and some sessions where there were five. And so, and we were trying to work with our family and community engagement teams, with our um, communication teams to get that out. But I know it's a priority for us next year and we want to do that same thing because we got to get in front of parents. We got to convince parents and make sure that they know um, what we are doing, what their students are exposed to, and how we're keeping them safe. So what I would add to that is, um, it's about parents understanding what to expect as well as having access to information. And so myself and um, my colleagues on the board have been really thinking about this category of work as, that we call parents as partners. Um, and so one, what I find, whether it's a, a lockout, a lockdown, um, fire alarm, you know, sometimes parents can see DPD cars at schools. They're like, what's happening? I'm like, they just, their kids go here, you know? But we haven't been able to clearly communicate and so one of the things that we are thinking about bringing to schools and we love your feedback here we've also received a bunch of feedback when we do have um, particular incidents is how do we make it front and center uh, parent information portals and what to expect when particular things happen so whether there is a charge whether there's an incident we can be clearer and more consistent across the district um, who to call when this happens, what happens, and what is our protocol, as well as law and statute, to help mitigate some of that confusion. Thank you. Um, this is a question more for the state representatives. Um, do you commit to working to pass a comprehensive school finance act to bring Colorado up to the national average so we can adequately fund mental health supports in all schools? Um, I, I think this is another one where the issue is uh, we only represent, or you only represent part of the state. Uh, something I wanted to, to throw in here, you talked about the additional resources that were put towards mental health um, this year, and it was substantial. A lot of those were grant programs, and do we move in future legislative sessions to make those more expansive and more permanent, or is it we did that and now we have other things to do? Um. Great question. So we have a school finance act that hasn't been substantially rewritten since 1994. We have 178 school districts that compete for about $6.4 billion that we distribute through that formula that hasn't been updated, that doesn't reflect 21st century education needs. What it actually reflects is districts more than it does our students and what our students need. The school finance interim committee is going into their third year uh, this year to see how we can rewrite that formula to better reflect uh, 21st century education here in Colorado. Um, so it's, there's more to come on the School Finance Act. When it comes to the mental health and the school safety grant programs that have been established, there have been significant dollars that have been pumped in to those uh, grants that are outside of the formula, which is at the moment um, uh, what I would hope to see is them tied into the formula so that it's consistent forever and into in perpetuity to solve that problem. Does anyone else have other? Okay, great. Um, uh, I think that one got covered. So why won't the legislature pass anti-assault weapon laws? What is the resistance? And I think, I think part of the question that's embedded here is um, it doesn't seem super likely we're going to see federal action real soon on this. What could we be doing more at the state level even if it didn't have the full effect? You've heard Alex, and Alex will talk about the positives. I'll play devil's advocate, and I'll play the negatives. Um, when you pass a ban in the state of Colorado, 
you can't, oh yeah, I'm Alec, and this is Alex. Um, if you confuse us, you won't be the first. Uh, it happens every, uh, yeah, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, that's fine. I still have the hippest neighborhood. Um, uh, when you pass a ban in a state, essentially it's a patchwork, right? So if you can get in your car and you can drive to Wyoming, have you solved the problem? In a country that allows zombie guns to be essentially mailed to a residence, it just, what they do is they mail parts of the gun, and so it's not actually, they can get, they can bypass state laws by mailing you all of these uh, pieces that you then put together to create the assault weapons. Uh, you know, that is, no matter what we do on the state level when it comes to this, it is a patchwork. So that is why we need, we desperately need federal action on this issue. One issue that I do think that we can tackle that I've been working with um, Ann and Eileen on is 3D guns. I think the next generation of guns, uh, which are, pose a very significant danger um, to metal detectors, uh, ease and to get through background checks and, and, and you name the list of, of issues. Uh, but again, I talked about the layers of government and where the, the best solutions can come from. The city of Denver has passed a bump stock ban and to my knowledge, not one bump stock has been turned in. It's good, pol I mean, it's I believe in the policy, but does it work on a city level to create a ban like that? And my, my answer is I don't think it does. You know, you, you played both sides of, of the issue. You really kind of, you, you explained it exactly as it is. I mean, the only thing I can add to that is that there is the political will uh, amongst those who are in the majority to, to make things happen on a state level, even if they are symbolic. But what is the price that is paid? Is it that no longer will we have the ability to stop the bills that uh, Majority Leader Garnett was talking about being passed? So we are in a, a situation that is very, very, uh, frustrating and that I think everybody up here would like to see us pass you know major statewide gun reforms but going back to 2013 it may result in us actually seeing a huge rollback in gun safety so um, I guess I played devil's advocate too in saying that there's a lot of, of calculation that has to go into how we approach these issues we know where the support is and we know what we need to get it done is 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 public will the ability for the public to go out and fight with us, the ability, you know, like moms demand to go okay. knock doors when somebody is under threat. So um, it's very complex. Uh, and like Representative Garnett said, and we keep coming back to um, the federal assault weapons ban was extremely, extremely successful in reaching its goals. So I'd like to see that too. Um, I'd like, or we can come back this way, but I'd actually like Eileen to weigh in. I, I just wanted to comment um, to emphasize what Representative Valdez said and others. If you care about this issue, you are out there helping Tom Sullivan. We cannot, cannot, cannot lose that seat. We cannot do this to some so, so give money and walk. I've been telephoning, I've been walking. It's, it's, it's just essential that we protect Tom. And can, can I actually ask you one more question? Uh, you know, I mean, we, we talked about the need for federal action. At the same time, we do see when state laws are different that there, there are different rates of gun violence. Um, does it make no difference what we do here in Colorado? Is it so marginal that it's not <laughs> the primary thing we need to do? Oh, there's a, there's a strong, if you do correlation coefficients, I can't remember the number, but it's a moderate to strong correlation between if a state has strong gun laws and what the uh, gun violence situation is. Stronger gun laws, lower gun violence. It is, it's a very strong correlation. So yes, there are things we can, that we still lack. I have a list of about 20 laws that we lack in this state that, could be done, that we could enact. Um, we just talked about a few of them tonight, the ones dealing with youth and, um, and schools. But there's much, much that we can do. And yes, it has an impact. Um, did you want to comment? I just, uh, 
I just wanted to say one other thing uh, that wasn't quite addressed in the question, and that related to us uh, passing these sort of pilot grant programs and would we see expansion. And I, um, so this is a little bit tangential, but I just, I, I want to also say that we here in Colorado are um, really handcuffed by something very problematic called TABOR. And so you have a legislature that is elected to, um, to govern, except that we can't actually address our, our financial, our fiscal constraints because of TABOR in, um, in a really logical way. And so that, I think, is why sometimes you will see um, things done in a pilot or, or a piecemeal way because we don't have the funding to address all of the things that we need to address. Um, and so you will have an opportunity coming soon to the ballot to help us to be able to retain some of that revenue. Um, if um, So if you would spread the word on that, I think that would uh, go a long way to expanding some of these grant programs that you like to see. Um, our next question is, and I think it speaks to some of what uh, was just addressed, what can, should we be doing as parents and constituents to prevent further school shootings? Where should we be focusing our energy to make a difference in the immediate future? And I think that can be answered by, by anyone who has a strong idea. Um, I just think t tonight was a tonight was a great start. I mean, this is community coming together and people talking is how this happens. Uh, you just, just it's how you organize. You, you start this. You bring these communities. Maybe this needs to be rolling in other parts of Denver. Maybe this needs to go out to Jefferson County and the other districts and and just get the conversations going. Um, everything is about you. Um, everything we do, everything we do, is based on what you guys tell us and what we feel is right. And this is a huge thing. I, being in the legislature, the most effective things that sway discussions and bills is hearing from people that this has really happened to. And this is probably the most effective way to influence us and the way on other people. We're safe bets. Even I, I learned a lot in working in campaigns. The oil and gas bill. Talking to people in Weld County, where that was not a very popular bill, that's what, these conversations need to ha these conversations need to happen in places where the, the, our strength is. It needs to happen in their communities, and that would be the best place to go is to go and talk to them and find where the middle ground is. So I think that is the best start. You know, I think you know to address you know violence in schools and to you know I think one is talking to your kids and I think you know. Um, also, I'm just going to say it, we should stop glorifying school shootings across this country. It seems like every time we turn on the, the news, they are, we are, we are, you know, showing our young folks, you know, look what happened, this person brought a gun, or, you know, this person shot somebody, and we need to quit glorifying it across our 24-7 news cycle. And we need to be talking with our students about, you know, um, what it means to be, you know, good members of their school community and good members of our community, and also addressing, you know, that, you know, suicide risk among uh, kids between 13 and 18 is a real issue. And, you know, we have substantially increased our suicide risk reviews this year in DPS, and that's a real problem. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, what they are seeing on a daily basis in our community. And we, got, and we, we need to make changes with that. You know. Or I was going to uh, let the board member Bacon, but then you can go next. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of that because um, the teacher in me, um, and also as someone who feels they're an activist, um, I think we need to do better in our schools when talking about a few things. One, what does it mean to know how to build power um, and presence? Uh, we don't teach civics as much as we used to. Um, and also when we talk about relationship building and what it means to actually lead for young people. I think part of the shift in high school should be about actualizing power, actualizing identity, and relationship building. And that needs to show up in schools a little bit more. We also need to know how our systems work. Um, I can't tell you how many people that I've met who've moved into Colorado who don't know what Tabor is. 
right? I say, they're like, I got an $8 check back from the state. I bought some coffee. I'm like, wouldn't you rather? Dot, 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 right? And so we need to talk about these things in our institutions, and our students are our best advocates um, and the ones to spread the word. So I'm looking into that. Thank you. One of the things that came out of the Parkland shooting that, that really stood out to me was, was how the students organized and started talking to the right people about this issue. We've reiterated countless times that we represent Denver and we are all there and ready to take action. But the STEM shooting, the Columbine shooting, these happen in districts that are most likely represented by somebody who does not share our view. So we need to bring pressure in the right place to make sure that the people in those communities understand that their representative is voting against school safety, that they are voting to proliferate more guns, and, and, and it starts with organization. So I really, I truly believe we organize and we point our efforts at the right place. Um, our next question, um, teachers need help with behaviors in our schools. It's disturbing to see a teacher have to take down a child. How can we as educators help parents get the resources that they need for their families? Um, I think there's sort of two questions in there. Um, sort of what help can teachers get and, and then how do schools then support parents in getting what they need? I'm measured in how I answer this. Um, so I'm a former teacher. I'm also a former administrator and, and disciplinarian. And something that we have to talk about in regards to supporting teachers and behavior is we have to also be able to talk to our teachers and families and kids in understanding why behaviors are happening. Um, and so as someone who's advocated to change the discipline code for DPS, um, and also was at the Capitol trying to eliminate out-of-school suspensions for our littlest learners, um, we needed to say and talk about trauma, talk about um, lashing out in a way that described that behavior as a reaction and a consequence of something, not character. And so we have to be very intentional about having those conversations. And it's another thing to just mandate something without providing support. So when we say we want to eliminate suspensions and eliminate bias, we have to then also fund that and allow our teachers to be professionals and grow into an understanding of what that is. Um, and give them the room to do that without impacting kids because the criminalization piece is something that's real. Um, we do have, if you're African American, you're four times more likely to be suspended or referred to law enforcement. And our teachers are right in that space. And rather than going into a blame space, we have to do our part to actually train so that we can hold each other accountable. Um, and so we've got to, we, you know, this is part of the Black Excellence Resolution to take this on and say, we will train in bias. Do you understand? And also at the front lines, you know your kids the best. So how can we lean into hugs versus cuffs? And that's something we need to take very seriously and not just in DPS, across the state. I just, I would like to also, I appreciate, um, I appreciate that, Jennifer. I think to expand upon that, um, we talk about mental health support services in schools, but I don't often hear people talking about um, social and emotional learning and skill building, both for teachers and for students and the, and the parent, the home piece as well. I um, was a former administrator at, at an early learning center that placed a heavy uh, emphasis on the development of social and emotional skills, used a program called Conscious Discipline. And this is a really crucial component to making our schools more safe. It has to do with community building, community involvement, relationship-centered schools, and fostering that teacher-student uh, rapport. And so I think this is something that we should talk about more. It is often a resource issue. Um, my son's school happens to have a social and emotional learning coach, and that coach is paid for um, by the funds that the PTO raises. Um, from parents, 
Well, not every school raises that money. So it, it's, it's seriously an equity issue that we have to address. And so maybe that's part of a conversation we can continue to have about what can we do statewide to address this in an equitable manner. Yeah, no. So we have a question that came from Facebook Live, and um, I think this is one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, what data do we have about how lockdown drills traumatize students? Um, I have wondered a lot, are, are we actually teaching students something that will keep them safe, or are we going through this theater that is traumatizing an entire generation because we won't act outside of the schools? So I think it's a balance. I think that, you know, um, a prepared school community in an emergency is going to act with calmness and um, is going to, quite frankly, you know, have a positive outcome in that experience, as opposed to an untrained school community that's going to panic. And the last thing we need is a thousand kids in our school panicking over a uh, critical situation. And so we do, unfortunately, have to train. And we have to, it's not just training first responders, it's not just training teachers, we have to train our students. And we have to do that regularly for repetition. But there are ways that we can do it without traumatizing, specifically our smallest kids, right? So one of the things we did this year in DPS was we went to the kindergarten and first grade classrooms before we did a lockdown drill, and we handed out Slurpee coupons and said, hey, you know, we're going to do some training here, and this is what's going to happen, and, and, and talk to them about it before we actually implement it. And try to make it fun, or, you know, hey, whoever's the quietest classroom gets, you know, free Slurpees from us, you know, uh, uh, to hand out. Um, you know, because unfortunately it is our reality right now, but I still believe that we have to make sure our schools are trained in order to save lives in critical situations. I just want to comment. I, I grew up in Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so we had so many drills on uh, nuclear attack. But what was fascinating is when I was in seventh grade, a tornado hit our school, and I still marvel that we all knew what to do immediately. We all d d jumped under our desks as soon as we heard the sounds. Uh, can I add to that? Yeah, please. So the question was on the, the data, right? Yeah, that was the question. Um, yeah. And sorry, no, I took it over okay, a little bit I, too. I grew up in Florida, don't get me, I mean, we're 90 miles, right? Um, I, so here's what we do have. Um, one of the things that we are thinking about measuring, and actually uh, for the students in the audience, and any of you who are part of Student Board of Education, I would love your help on this as well, to figure out how to ask this question without traumatizing our, our students. But I think you all know the questions that your classmates um, would respond to with this um, to help us build that data. We have an indirect measure through our whole child supports. Um, so I'm not sure if any of your students or any of the students here have taken it. One of the things we tried to sample, you know, build a sample around was asking kids if they feel safe. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of reasons why someone may or may not feel safe, but we now um, have moved to a place where we want to measure whole child supports as well as whole child outcomes. Um, it changed in our teacher negotiation, in our teacher contract, for those of you familiar, we now will support the schools that have become blue in whole child supports. Um, you know, that's where the, the stipend comes in um, by way of performance, that was a shift. Um, we're thinking about how do we restructure our school performance framework to figure out actually what kids and parents want to know about a school so that they can use it to choose a school, which also means we need to now ask parent satisfaction, right, whole child support, to change our measurements so that it could be a better tool because this is something that 
we are noticing is important when it comes to decision making. So we do have that survey. Not all of our schools started taking it. It'll likely happen in the next year. And hopefully we can use that to kind of, schools can use that to figure out why the answers are yes or no to be able to better respond to their students. Yeah. And so for, for those who aren't familiar with the SPF, there's a school performance framework and it's traditionally been more reliant on test score data. And so the shift is to, to take into account a broader range of, of things. Um, and I actually wanted to, um, I'm not totally sure where, we're, where we are on time time. It's 7.53, okay. Um, so before we wrap up, I wanted to, um, to go back to Eileen. Um, you had shared some statistics at the beginning and I know your slide show, you didn't have your slides. Um, the question is, um, how can people get that data? Where is it shared? Is there a place it lives online? Um, and I'm also curious, you know, there was a lot of talk about policy and I'm curious with the expertise that you have, if there's any sort of closing um, thoughts you have. Okay, sorry. Um, we can put this online, give us a few days, but we will put the, um, particularly the um, graph of uh, gun deaths and correlating with uh, gun sales online, and I'll see what else we can put online statistically, um, information from this, and I could, um, and if you send me, if you send a note through that with the join us saying I'd like the talk, the the slides, I can send you the PowerPoint or a PDF with the PowerPoint so we can do that. Um, in fact, you could, I could just tell you right now if you send a note to info at coloradoceasefire.org with that request, I can res we can get that and respond to you. What I didn't get enough time to say, and I actually am a retired school teacher, I taught in Aurora at Gateway High School and the uh, theater shooting hit um, just after I retired. Uh, you know, I had, we used to have lockdown drills and I, I was frustrated that my students didn't take, this is high school, that they didn't take them seriously and they thought it was kind of a fun event. And I kept trying to instill in them that it was important and that I worked with Tom Mauser and whose son was um, shot and killed at Columbine and they didn't seem to get it and I've often wondered that if things changed when you know they lost one of their fellow students in the Gateway excuse me in the Aurora Theater but I did want to talk a little bit because the the Rocky Mountain gun owners and their allegiant legislators have tried six years to get anyone who has a concealed carry permit to be able to take them into our public schools so it's not just teachers, it'd be anyone, any of those 252,000 people in the state. But most people t think when they talk about guns in schools, they think of arming teachers. And as a retired teacher, I will tell you why it's such a bad idea. Um, actually, schools, despite what we're here about tonight and concerned about it, they're actually the safest places for students during the day. Um, and it assumes that shooters are seeking out schools because they're gun-free zones. The FBI can show that's not true. It assumes that guns make us safer, where if that were true, guys, we would be the safest place on earth from gun violence. Um, it fails to take into account the element of surprise. The shooter knows what he or she's going to do, and you're out there teaching math lessons. And not and so there's a, the whole surprise part. Um, also that actually self-defense by gun use, using guns is rare, and we've seen in just the Highlands Ranch stem shooting. Uh, it was unarmed students who attacked the shooter. That happens a number of times, and actually there are very, very few events where armed citizens have successfully intervened to stop an active shooter. Uh, we would have very short training sessions for these teachers in it, bringing a lethal, uh, a lethal weapon into a school environment. It complicates liability issues. And also, you know, police officers who when they're training and they're in, or in their uh, under stress in a shooting incident, only 20% of their shots hit the target. What happens to the other 80% of the bullets? And now put them in the hands of an un untrained teacher, a relatively untrained teacher. Those bullets are going into other, in, into crowded classrooms, they're going into students or into the next door classroom. I would also comment that 
makes teacher parent teacher conferences a very different situation if you think the other person's armed and um, confusion to <laughs> confusion to rescuers who if a teacher's taken on a shooting role and the rescuers come in and they're not sure what in heck this person is who's got a gun are they the assailant or are they a defender so um, just a number of them yeah. I, uh, I think it is lunacy absolute lunacy to uh, bring go guns into public schools. Oh. Okay. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> we're um, we're being cut off, but I'm probably I'm sure there's people who would. No, no, no. I think that was important. Um, and the the one that I want to add on there is um, when we talk about implicit bias in our classrooms and disparities in discipline, and then we think about who is considered a threat, and just want to add that one in there too. Um, um, so I was asked to announce there is, um, this is uh, the Giffords, um, Gabby Giffords Courage Fellowship. This is for students between, or uh, youth between ages 16 and 20. Are you passionate about saving lives from gun violence or do you know someone who is? Do you want to learn new skills and become a better advocate? Do you want to organize your generation to end gun violence? There are five more days to apply for this um, fellowship. And so I think if you, this is an email, but if you Google Giffords Courage Fellowship, I'm sure you can get more information. Um, for folks who want to stay connected, there is an email sign-up sheet, and, um, and I just want to thank, um, thank again Interneighborhood Cooperation for having us, all of our elected officials for being here. Um, a big thank you to the students um, for making time during this part of the school year and to everyone who showed up tonight. <laughs>